اقنعني ما تحب وترضى من قولي والعمل والنيه والهدى انك على كل شيء قدير يا وهاب يا وهاب يا وهاب يا فتاح يا فتاح يا فتاح يا جبار يا جبار يا جبار <coughs> beloved brothers and elders and dear listeners and mothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we ask allah azza wa jalla that in this uh, meeting of ours allah azza wa jalla allows us to hear and share that which would be most benefit of most benefit and most in need for all of us and inshallah may he allow us to practice on the good and propagate it and allow on uh, this majlis to become a means of rejuvenating the love for allah and the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam in our hearts amin rabbil alamin righteousness of a household reading from kitab al riqaq zuhri narrated that umar al-khattab radiyallahu anhu recited the verse إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا أم الخطاب رضي الله عنه recited the verse which means those who say our Lord is Allah and then they are upright our Lord is Allah then they are upright he said استقاموا والله لله بطاعته ولم يرغوا رغان الثعالب by Allah they were upright to Allah by obeying Him. وَلَمْ يَرْغُوا بِرْغَانَ الثَّعَالِبِ And they were not as crafty as foxes. Meaning that after saying Allah is our Lord, istaqamu they remained upright, steadfast, and they didn't try to find loopholes. And they didn't try to find loopholes in the deen. Because it's possible for a person to say that he's a believer. And then after, when it comes to the actual implementation of the deen, they find ways and methods in which they can follow their nafs and not obey what Allah Azza wa Jal has asked them to do so. And when questioned, or when encouraged to follow the responses that they will give will make you think that they are being crafty and sly as foxes are and this is not something which is being a fox and sly and crafty like in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> is exactly what Iblis did because he also claimed to be a believer and a very big believer and a big worshiper but when he came to something that he didn't like which was to put his head down in front or rather simply show his uh, pleasure or gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by humbling himself in front of Adam alayhi salam he became very crafty and started asking and saying, wait, how come this doesn't make sense? That you created me from fire and you created him from soil. Why should I have to humble myself? This is what we're speaking about. Crafty is a fox. Fi in itself, this statement is correct. It's true. Adam was created differently. And Iblis was created, and Shaitan was created differently. But this is not the place to talk about that. This is the place to say, Samiana wa ta'ana, we listen and obey. He didn't miss that, he messed that up. So the fact that he, but, but now look, let me, let, me, let me speak about the usul, let me speak about the reality. I mean, am I wrong? Well, we don't care what you say. If anything you say it goes against what Allah asks you to do, then it's wrong. So this is the shaitani answer is to say no I'm right. Shaitani answer to say prove me wrong on paper. Shaitani answer is to say what you're saying may be right but what have you got an answer to this etc etc. You see this shaitani answer today common amongst children when, spo- when being spoken to by their parents Common among students when spoken to them by their teachers. 
Common by mentors, by mentees when they're spoken to them by their mentors. Common by murids when they're spoken to them by their sheikh. Just yesterday, I was speaking to someone. And I said, the, the khanqas are gone. The zawiyat. Find me one place where the traditional zawi and khanqa is present. That is easily accessible. Let's say, if, not even in America, beyond America. The reason is, I told him, Sunni wale chale ke, to kehne wale bhi band kar diye bakyana. Manne wale khatam ho ge. The people who listen and obey are gone. They're extinct. That's why the people who train and say also have stopped speaking and training. Because it doesn't seem to be, you don't see a group of people saying, train me, put me into a position where I will listen to whatever you've got to say. Because I am after something which is a training of my nafs. I want to make tahveeb of it. That's not happening. Before, you are well aware, a student would come. You wouldn't come with a set time. Where is my sheikh? I'm coming to you from far. I want a syllabus for my tazkiyah. What's the first day? What's the second day? What's written out? Where's my place to stay? Where is my, what is going to be the meals? I also need to know the menu in advance every week. What's going to be served at what time? Shouldn't come before, shouldn't come after. And whatever I'm asked to do, it should be very clear cut. Should not be anything added to what was mentioned at the beginning, nor subtracted from what was mentioned at the beginning. The mindset of today wasn't present. You would go sit. And he said, I'm here. He said, okay, well, I want you to hit the garden first. Get rid of all these weeds. Wait, I am such and such person. I have never done landscaping before. My father would have kept me at home. Why would he send me here? Oh, if he would have kept you at home, then go home. Then go home. Why did you come here? If you're here, you listen and you obey. If someone says, wipe the bathroom, that's exactly what you need to do right now. If someone says, de-weed the garden, that's exactly what you're going to do right now. Whatever needs to be done at the khanqa and the zawiya, you must do it. And if you sit there and arguing back, then you're, you, after one year also you frown, that means you haven't gained anything. If you can spend one year without frowning, without saying why, without saying how come, without saying this doesn't make sense, that means you've broken your nafs. And you can actually become something. In order to build, you need to destroy. In order to move forward, you have to give up all this baggage. And in order for that baggage to be removed from our lives, <clears throat> we have to know how to conquer our nafs. And conquering our nafs is not something easily done. It requires a team effort. It requires someone to listen and someone to speak. Someone to take orders and someone to give orders. Someone to lay out a plan, and someone to say, I close my eyes and I follow it to the T. When you have that type of obedience, then you can actually create an amazing human being. This is why in the recent past, when ulama would be graduating from the Dar or Alums, 60, 70 years ago, they were not given any jaza. Or they will not be given a certificate until they spent six months or more in the company of an accomplished sheikh where they were put through a rigorous spiritual training which did not include just fasting, did not include just doing dhikr, staying awake at night for long hours. That was there. But beyond that, it was a training of learning how to listen. Learning how to Put your nafs under your foot and take orders from your elders. This is what used to make people unique, what made them amazing agents of change. And that is why you don't see what you would see in the past today. 
not only from graduates of madrasas, not only uh, uh, graduates from uh, in different institutions, but even from the sons and the daughters of the ummah. Generally speaking, you see that there is such a high regard of themselves. Everyone thinks that they're entitled to their own opinion. Every single child, every single youngster, every single adult thinks that I am entitled to my opinion. How dare someone can come and tell me what to do? This is death, nothing but one of the signs of the hour. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, I'ajabu kulli dhi ra'yin bi ra'yi. When every single person will be impressed by his own opinion, then you can't speak to anyone at that time. This is one of the final, final signs when after which a person has been instructed to leave and go into the mountains. When everyone will be only impressed with their opinion, not willing to listen to anyone. That's, not yet, that's yet to happen. We're not there yet fully. Still, mashallah, people do listen. Some at least, after multiple tries. But a time will come when no one will listen. And everyone will think only he is right. And at that time, it's no point in speaking. You need to pack up and go into the mountains. So this is why, subhanAllah, the aspect of ita'atul amir, listening to the amir, your parents, your teachers, is such an important aspect of our deen. If we don't do that, then we will definitely be listening to our nafs and shaitan. It's so achieve. I'm coming to the dars here before Fajr, just looking at my phone from <laughs> maybe the last two hours only. And already, I of course, received messages throughout the night. But uh, one of the messages of a person, you know, mother, is complaining about mothers who were crying due to the disrespect shown to them by their daughters. She was explaining, explaining about three different mothers who came to her saying that my daughters are so disrespectful. What is this disrespectful? This is again something Nabi Sallallahu said, that a slave girl will give birth to her own master. Meaning, one of the explanations is, the way girls and boys as well will disrespect their parents. Especially why girl can be mentioned is because you would expect that from society's history that daughters would be more respectful to their parents than sons. That even when a daughter will begin to mistreat her, not father, but her own mother, to a degree, though it seems as a daughter is the owner, of the mother, that the mother is a slave of the daughter. This is one of the f- explanations of this famous hadith that talks about the signs of the hour. If this is how the daughter will treat her mother, how will the son treat the father or the mother? Much worse than that. That's one of the signs of the hour. So this is the shaitaniyat that is prevalent across the globe today and that is running through the veins of men and women of the ummah. No one seems to want to listen to anyone. No one seems to want to consult anyone. And even when given advice, they don't take it. When a person is blinded by his own desires and doesn't want to take advice, then there's only so much you can do to help. And I'm, I see this year something which I didn't see last year. And I see last year something which I saw, didn't see the previous year the level of insolent behavior from the youth of the ummah against their parents and the level of disobedience it's crazy and it's true students and mentees they don't listen that's why the shuyukh also and subhanallah I was speaking about my, my, my past sheikh who passed away Qari Amirul Hassan rahmullah, to one of the students one group of my, one of my classes I was speaking about his fadail, his virtues, and his, what an amazing person he was. So after speaking for a while, I said, man, I miss him. Let me see if I can find something for him, because he was not, he was not on YouTube, not online. Of course, you can't find any videos of him, ever. I don't think there's a single video of him. And even audio, it wasn't, you know, didn't pro- not much there available for audio. So I just typed his name in, and all of a sudden I found one audio clip on YouTube, maybe one and a half minute. 
He just someone took a grainy picture of his and plastered that as a bullet and as a thumbnail on that audio clip. And in that one minute, that's exactly what he was saying. That this is the time today that people don't listen to their parents, don't listen to their teachers, don't listen to their sheikh. How are you going to be able to listen to Allah and His Rasul? This is just what he's saying. I said, wow. This is the crux of everything. What is tazkiyah? What is tasawwuf? What is ihsan? What's all of that? If you can't listen, game over. Go out. Go play, go play golf somewhere. You're not going to be able to do anything if a person cannot simply take orders from human beings that he sees in front of him, who fed him, who guided him, who clothed him, who taught him. And you can just turn your back right around in an instance and forget everything that you have taken from someone and disregard everything they say. How is it possible for this person to truly be honoring Allah and His Rasul? Not possible. Not possible. One of the things I've noticed is the level of disrespect that starts from little kids. It's not, we're not talking about this germ or disease coming in to elders. We're seeing little children, sing, you know, two, three, four year old toddlers and children that they are themselves also right here, crafty as foxes. Their dads or moms will say something and they will respond back. Who are you to respond back? Not possible. Was not, did not happen. This did not happen 30 years ago. When the father and mother will get upset at a child, no child would look back into the eyes of their parents and stand there. Every single child would feel overwhelmed and look down. This is what a normal sane human being does. When authority gets upset at you, you look down. And this is mentioned in the Quran. That their eyes will be downcast. Their necks will be lowered. Heads will be lowered. They will not, be, they will not have the courage to lift their heads. They will not have the courage to look up. It is the anger of Allah, the wrath of Allah, the awe of Allah on the day of judgment. This is the natural response of a person who is afraid of some being or someone in front or who is full of respect. Abdullah, Amr ibn As, Amr ibn As, radiyallahu anhu, the conqueror of Egypt, he says, that, Lam akun minhu lahu, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that if you were to ask me to describe my prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I would not be able to do so. Because I never looked at him into his eyes. The conqueror of Egypt, someone who is well known for his intelligence, well known for his ability to be crafty on the battlefield, and well known to be an amazing general, filled with valor and courage. But this great conqueror of Egypt says, I never looked into the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ. I never looked at his face properly. When the Prophet ﷺ would enter, everyone besides Abu Bakr and Umar had, would not have the courage to even lift up their eyes. When the Prophet ﷺ would be there, we would always be looking down. What is this? This is not some Desi culture. This is the sunnah of the Sahaba in their respect for their Nabi alayhi salatu salam. And it is this, this is what has been passed down for the past 15 centuries of how you're supposed to show respect to your teachers, to your mashayikh, and of course your parents. Now you see that is gone, not only from elders, but little ones. And you wonder, where did these little ones learn how to disrespect and forget respect? Where did this come from? Which school did they get this from? Which preschool are they learning this from? And it's actually, it's disrespect is in the air. It's not in a school only. It's not in an educational system only. It's actually in the air. You and I breathe it. We, we are inhaling it. And this is what's creating a general sense of disrespect and disregard in li- from little, little kids all the way to adults. To author- disrespect to authority, disrespect to the teachers. What do I mean it's in the air? I mean just like fuhsh. And just like indecency, just like LGBTQ, 
Just like addiction to haram, listening to haram, watching haram. Just like all of these things which are taking over our community. Which like never before. Within decades, we're losing huge swaths of our population to absolutely un-Islamic ideologies and, and, wave, and absolutely un-Islamic mindsets. How it's happening as though something is in the air. Similarly, loss of adab. Adab. Loss of respect. Loss of manners with our elders is also disappearing just like that. If we talk about the melting ice caps of the North and the South Pole, we talk about disappearing of forests in the Amazon, we have to obviously agree. Just like that never happened before, we also never have seen an evaporation of etiquette from our society. And it's part of the environment we live in today. It's something that you have to make a strong, unbelievably strong effort to simply save your household. And doesn't mean your effort will get you anywhere. After that, you have to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save your, your children, to save your sons and daughters, to save yourself. It requires a lot of effort, more than ever before. And it requires a lot of dua and begging and beseeching from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the new Iblisi variant that is spreading across the globe, infecting even little children as young as one and two to make them disobedient, disrespectful to their parents. And I was mentioning elsewhere that today's kids are also crafty and sly like this. But many fathers don't even realize that this is a problem. Many mothers, uncles and aunts don't realize that this is an issue that needs to be treated. They smile, they laugh, they make a comment, they say, that's so cute, that's so nice. My little grandson is so smart. No, Iblis was also smart. Nothing to be proud about. If your grandson is smart and he says something disrespectful to you, that is nothing to be excited about. They say, wow, he's so intelligent. Rather you should sit there and say, oh, how did this happen in my household? How can it be that my daughter and my son, the very basic things, my grandson and my granddaughter, the very basic thing which is adab to your elders, how come they, they did something or said something which goes against that? It's because there's something in the air. You need to realize that. Don't sit there and coo at your kids and say, oh, that's so cute. Nope, that's not cute. Disrespect is never cute. Disregard for eldership, elders is never cute. And being, going above and beyond, going, being, going forward and above your parents is never cute. Just yesterday, another student, I was giving him advice, I said, if your ustad says something to you which is wrong, hey, today it's very sunny outside, or it's very dark out there, and you, you, your job should be to not correct them. Your ustad says something, your parents say something, learn how to not correct. Simply learn how to stay quiet. Today, it's this basic thing. Father and son will come in. You have an interview at school, at the madrasa. And a person will ask, you know, subhanAllah, so how, what is the ages of your kids? Or you're, oh, you have another kid who's not here. What's your, you know, how old are they? A father might just say, oh, she's seven. What will happen? That, that 11-year-old, well, who, no one asked that 11-year-old. He's lucky to be even sitting with his father in the office. But he will pipe up and say, no, she is nine. Well, who asked you to speak? Your father is sitting there. Why are you talking? Now, this is not say. Which father corrects his son? You tell me that. Which father will correct his daughter to say, hey, why are you speaking? It is between me and so and so. If you don't know how to zip it up here, how are you going to be able to zip it up when I say something you don't want to hear? It's the same problem. The kids have this habit of just blurting out things and saying things. And it's they're not their fault. They're innocent, مغير مكلف, little children. The fault is that their parents don't correct them. And then they wonder, how have they become disrespectful? We sat after my talk somewhere last night. 
someone came to me and said, please make dua for me. I've got six, six children. I raised them all with hijabs and, 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 and uh, um, abaya and all that. But now, no one listens. Everyone's removed it. And when I ever say something, they say, Baba, you know what? We're tired of you. I'm leaving. He said, one of my older ones has left the house. She stays somewhere else. And she doesn't want to talk to me. She says, you're too religious. And all the other ones, after the elder one took off her hijab, all the rest of them have followed suit. They haven't left the house yet. And I said, well, why don't you bring them to the environment? We got a graduation. We have a program. Bring them here. Oh, who's going to listen to me? I said, bring the little ones. So I got a job. I said, who cares about your job? When you're telling me you lost your kids, the heck with your job. Oh, I'm volunteering here. I said, forget this volunteering. No one cares about your... You're not going to be asked on the day of judgment or in the grave about your volunteering and your job. You're going to be asked about your six kids. And you already, unfortunately, are not doing too well. You've already lost for a few of them who've left your jurisdiction, left your house, who don't even come to say salam. Months and years go by. At least the younger ones grab them and travel 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Bring them into the environment. At least try. And stop speaking to them. Now there's a time. There was a time for you to speak. You didn't speak. You didn't speak when, it was, when you were supposed to be so broken. Now, subhanAllah, when the tree has become crooked, you want to say, hey, let me go fix this tree. Let me straighten it. It's too late. You have to cut it. That's it. When that, when that tree was a small little plant growing, you had a chance to sit there and put it in a certain direction. But once that tree becomes a full-fledged, grown, adult, crooked tree, there's very little you can do. So for children... They need constant, constant intervention from their parents. But it has to be done in a loving, caring manner that kids will appreciate and will not get turned off by. But one problem is if you, are, you and I as moms and dads think dis- disregard to authority, disrespect to elders is cute, then we're never going to be able to address the issue. One father told me, he said, my young two and a half year old said, Baba, listen to me. And he says, okay. He said, no, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to complain about you to Allah. Now most of you sitting here, ask yourself, what would you say? Are, kya bola? How nice, mashallah. Allah, you know, he's ta'aluk with Allah. He wants to make dua to Allah. No, no, forget that part. Who are you to sit there and complain about your dad? You're two and a half and you're threatening your father that you're going to complain? This is not cute to me. This is called an infected child. If you tell your mom, that I'm, if you don't do this mom, I'm going to tell dad. There's so many houses, every house. Mom, I'm going to tell dad about you. Dad, when mom comes back, I'm going to tell her this is what you did. Who the heck are you? Who you think you are to say this to your father? That's a problem. How many fathers and mothers stop in their track and say, what did you just say? You're going to complain about me? What do you think you are? That's the point. Where are you getting this? And you're three years old. You're four years old. What's going to happen when you become 30? What's going to happen when you become 50? This type of sickness and disease, nothing less short of a disease, nothing short of an in shaitani infection, is starting at, at what? In, ad, in not adolescence. Disrespect doesn't come there. It's coming from these little toddlers. Now, there's a famous hadith. Man lam nas, lam the one who is not grateful to Allah, sorry, the one who is not grateful to the people can never be grateful to Allah. You heard that. Then you heard another hadith. Man lam kabirana, wa lam yarham sagirana, wa lam ulama'ana, falam kama The one who does not honor his elders, the one who does not shower mercy on his youngsters, and the one who does not show respect to our ulama, he is not from amongst us. Why is that? Because you cannot respect Allah. You will never be able to respect Allah. You will never be obedient to Allah if you cannot be obedient to your parents. And if you cannot be obedient to your ulama. And if you cannot be loving and caring to your young ones. Cannot be possible. It's just a matter of time. Shaitan creates this bagawat, right? This disrespect. 
disregard for authority within little kids. Today it's the mom. Tomorrow will be the dad. After that will be the teacher. Then will be the sheikh. Then will be the ustad. And now he's 16. He'll say, who's God? Who's God? Who's Allah? Where did this come from? This atheism is not starting in 25 year olds. We're seeing it in as young as 12 and 13. Muslim born, Muslim educated, Islamic school educated. 12, 13 year old kids saying they're no longer Muslim. How is this coming from? It starts from a very young age. And it starts with disrespect to authority. That's, that's the name of the game. Who had this? Iblis. That one statement, it was sufficient to put thousands of years of ibadah out the door. Who do you think you are to question Allah? But Ya Allah, I did a millions of years of ibadah. We don't care. This one slip is so bad. It tells me that you inside are absolutely hollow. That was just an act. That was just a show of ibadah. There was no ibadah here. Because someone who can critique and criticize Allah, he can never be an ibadah. Abid. That is just fake. You're doing some up and down, kiss the ground type of stuff. That doesn't make you a true Muslim. So this is when someone, kids may say, Baba, Mom, why are you judging me by something? Wait, the fact that you are even telling this to your parents, wait, wait, where did you get this ability to speak to your parents like this? That's what I'm talking about. I know this is a topic I probably never have spoken like this openly here. And I've spoken maybe to individuals. But not on the mic here. But subhanAllah, Allah will for me to speak on this. Because when I saw this, Rawgana Thalib, I went I on to talk about this, that being crafty as foxes is something which is not going to get us anywhere besides the place where shaitan is going. Because shaitan is one big fox and one sly fox. So the question is going to be, what's the solution? What's the solution? And the solution is to first recognize what we're, what's happening. Don't live in uh, d- denial. Don't wake up when your children are now 19, 20, 22. It's too late. You need to wake up when your child is 19 months, 22 months, 25 months. As soon as they can speak, you need to understand. I, I was, subhanAllah, speaking to another student yesterday. And he said, when you speak to the ustad, you have to have respect. And I said, nowadays they don't. I said, my own child, I remember Mike's son was, was two years old. I get upset at him. He would just look at me. And I remember I used to put my eyes on, I put my hands on his eye. And I used to make him, force him to look down. I said, no, when I am upset at you, don't look at me. I had to teach that. He was two years old. I had to teach that to his brother. Right? He said, no, you don't. You don't look down. You don't look at me. This is the etiquette. Like I got to teach him, you got to sit down how to, when you're drinking water. Don't hold your bottle of water with your left hand. This is how you go wash your backside when you go to the bathroom. Who teaches that? Dad has to teach all of that. And dad has to teach their sons and daughters that this is how you're supposed to act in front of your mom and dad when they're upset. You're not supposed to pout and turn around and walk away. You're not supposed to slam the door. Absolutely not. That's not acceptable. And then, remember, losing to your elders is actually victory. If your father or mother or your ustad or sheikh say something which you didn't like or which may have been factually incorrect but not seriously relevant to the future of your life like the weather, age, this incident on day, this day, that day, whatever, random things factually incorrect but doesn't really have to do anything with your future. If you simply not, do not respond and keep quiet this may be, you may regard this as a apparent defeat. But this is a victory for you. What do I mean by that? That is a victory and a triumph of your ruh over your nafs. It is a triumph of your akhlaq. It is a defeat of your nafs. If you can learn how to stay quiet and say, you know, aapki ghalat, aap, you know, they say that. I've heard this from my teachers. That the mistakes of our elders is also correct. 
Meaning what they mistake, Allah knows best. But if for me, I need to see, keep quiet. Hazrat Mufti Allah al-Haq, one of the most well-known ulama of the world, our Ustad, Muhtaram, Hazrat Mufti Sahab, whenever he had to defer with a scholar of the recent past, I remember in class, there would be instances where he would be explaining Sahih al-Bukhari, and he would say, the various opinions of different ulama, and then he would even mention Hazrat Shaykh Zakaria rahmatullah alayhi's opinion. And then he would mention his. Hazrat Shaykh is a human being. Hazrat Mufti Sahib is a human being. All are human beings. People can make mistakes. But never would he ever say that this is a musamaha or a slip on behalf of so and so. No. This is his words. Hazrat ki baat hame samaj mein nahi aati hai. Hazrat kya farmana chahte the? Albatta faqir ki ye raay hai. He said, what Hazrat Shaykh was trying to say, I'm not able to understand. Now we as students, youngsters, we're like, oh my God, look at this, this is amazing. I remember picking this up. That no, we understand what Shaykh Hazrat Shaykh is saying. And most definitely our Ustad understands what Hazrat Shaykh is saying. But this is the level of respect of how you show your difference. Is he didn't say he's wrong. Nahum rijal wa nahnu rijal. They're men and we are men. They're not anbiya. And so I'm going to call him out. Or I'm going to say, this is where Hazrat Shaykh made a mistake in explaining this hadith. Instead, he simply said, I'm not properly understanding what Hazrat Shaykh Zakaria is trying to say, but this is my opinion on this hadith. Which basically meant he differed. But look at the way you express your difference. This is something we learn. There's all, all topics written called Adab al Ikhtilaf. It's a whole genre, if you want to call it. Old topic, subject within Islamic literature of how to have the etiquette in difference of opinion. What are the etiquettes when expressing your differing opinion about something? There's a whole etiquette for that. That is when you have two giant ulama who spent six decades studying the deen. There is an etiquette when you differ on opinions. What about a two-year-old and his mom and dad? Isn't there going to be some etiquette? There you go. So the aspect of you losing to your elders is also a victory for you. That is a victory for your spirituality. That is a victory in the long run. As they say, you might have lost a battle, but you won the war. That's it. Because you have proven to yourself that you are a man and a woman of akhlaq. That you are a person of good character. That you are a person who is refined character that you don't give back answers, that you're not sly and slick in front of your elders. This is something that we need to educate and teach little kids at home. Inshallah, if you start young, then surely one day or another, you will be able to, with Allah's grace and fadl, purify our young ones from this disease. But you have to constantly, constantly keep on reminding Keep on correcting, keep on saying that this is how you have to respect your elders. This is how you respect your teachers. This is how you respect your ulama. This must be ingrained within our kids. Number two, that we ingrain it not only by correcting, but sharing stories. For them, for kids, what is one, or for even adults, stories is, has a huge impact. And Allah Azza wa Jalla, that's why I mention stories in the Quran. Because stories will give you the message and the lesson beautifully. It has a soft landing. Stories are a way to sugarcoat what you need to say. And it's much more acceptable to the audience. You get the point across without breaking anyone's heart, without being in your face. So this is why ta'aleem and reading through Stories of, of manners, good manners, good akhlaq, and stories of your own childhood. How, what happened between you and your mom and dad? And what happened between you and your teachers? Stories of that to be shared with our kids. It's so important. Every father and mother should speak about their childhood, should speak about things that they saw and they witnessed, which were not always right. But how did you respond? How did you show respect? That is something, inshallah, that will leave a very strong impression on our kids. Ta'aleem from a book, as well as your own personal experiences. Number three, traveling and visiting 
places where adab is still around. Leaving this environment for some time. Going out of, in America, visiting say a madrasa in a seminary like this, attending the programs for, for sons and daughters of the ummah to see deen, to see akhlaq, at least apparently. That's something the kids don't get a chance to even see apparently. They never. I remember one, one son, one boy who was here in the one year program some years ago. He said, Sheikh, you know what? I'm born and raised in Dallas. And I have, he's a half of the Quran. He said, I've never seen growing up in any store, Walmart or any department store, anyone dressed in a thobe all my life. All my life. 22, 23 years old. And he said, I'm here. And now, subhanAllah, it's not just Darussalam. It's this area. You go see at the stoplight. You see women in hijab and niqab, men dressed up in, in a certain, you know, thobe or qabis. You go to your local Aldi or, or Walmart or mall or wherever. Random place. And it's such a normal sight over here. You go to O'Hare Airport, you'll see so many people dressed in. They said, what is, what's going on? And actually, he was very happy. And he was saying that this gives me the, the, the strength to be able to dress in this manner as well. Because when you dress in this manner, let's leave out the whole sunnah issue. What sunnah, no sunnah, 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 sunnah al huda, sunnah al ada, and so forth. The key thing is when you have, when you dress in this manner, at least you have a distinct identity. Forget other people. You yourself know that everyone's looking at you that, oh wow, this guy is a, is, is a Muslim. Well, I guess we can't offer him what we offer everyone else. I guess we can't entice him with what we entice everyone else. Naturally dressed up in a thobe, in a, in a qamis, in a kufi, protects our youth at co- in college from so many temptations, from so many invitations towards haram. Similarly for our women, when they're dressed in an Islamic manner, then naturally a loads of stuff that would otherwise come their way, alhamdulillah, they're protected from it. So you see that environment. So if you're in America, come and spend some time over here in this environment for a few days, for a few weeks. But beyond that, even for those who live here, those who study here, it is very important to travel overseas. To go to places just simply out of this environment. I'm not saying Europe. I'm talking about third world countries. I'm talking about, you know, Africa. I'm talking about East Asia. Going there and spending. Go back to where your parents are from. Go back to your ancestral town. Or where maybe where you were born. Take your kids and spend a summer over there. Spend a, a winter over there. You say it's too hot. Well, that's the point. You want to learn that you aren't born with an AC and you're not going to have an AC in your grave. Learn how to live sometimes with heat. Well, there's no electricity at times. Well, that's great. That's what we need to learn. When you go through some mujahada, when you go through a little bit of tough time, it will, inshallah, be beneficial for us and our kids. When you see how children speak to their parents abroad, slowly but surely they change. You go to Pakistan, go to India. It's not what it used to be like, for sure. But also you'll see that those who speak the local language are still res- more respectful most of the time than the ones who speak English. Because that level of respect is still part of their language. When you become westernized, and when you be- take on English, it creates within you what? Individualism. It creates within you this own specific my identity. This is where this whole gender dysphoria came from. This is where this LGBTQ came from. Where is this coming from? It's simply like, I feel like, Are Baba, how you feel like this? What are you talking about? No, I'm an individual. This is my own personal experience. My, this is not a shared experience. My experience. I'm 26 years old, married. Got three kids, just decided that I am attracted to the same gender. This is happening right here in this community. People who are married have kids. And now they're 30 years old and decide that they actually need to go for a divorce because they're attracted to the same gender. Isn't this the height of Satanism or Satanic, you know, uh, whispers? I'm not saying these thoughts don't come. But how could you then say, okay, I have to obey it? But no. I'm an individual, I must follow and listen to what I've got to say. Baba, please don't come between me and myself. No. If these thoughts come, I spoke about it in Juma. Mufti bin Hayat spoke about it in Juma over here. If you weren't here for Juma khutbah, listen to it. But this is, all goes back to this whole individualism. Ittiba of hawa, ittiba of nafs. So going overseas 
inshallah, not to the big cities. You go to Hyderabad, since my parents are from there, you go stay in a, a, in a you know, million dollar mansion in Banjara Hills. Oh, I stayed in Hyderabad over the summer. No, I'm sorry, that's not gonna help. That's not gonna help. They'll come back even worse. Go find, go find your ancestral, ancestral t- maybe town. Go stay in a village. Like people like to go hiking and camping to enjoy nature. Similarly, we go out and say we are gonna go for a tourism. Don't tell your kids you're gonna go teach them Adam. Right then and there they're gonna can't rip their ticket. We, we're gonna go just for go see, enjoy nice foods and go see, your, go see where your dad was born and your grandfather was born. We'll go is, is, walk in the footsteps of your parents. And then spend their two, three, then mashallah there's local ulama there. There's local madaris there. Go visit the local hibs madrasas. Go, lo, go visit. When I went in India, Tamanal, I was amazed. Even for me, it was just an amazing refresher to go see where, what his students, you know, we go look at the simple, go look at what they serve in the mess hall to these kids. If possible, try to join them at one meal. I'm serious. I'm giving you something to do. Don't just go sit there and eat at Uno and Pizza Hut. No, go to, it doesn't, you can eat Pizza Hut here. Why do you have to go all the way to Pakistan and India to eat Pizza Hut and Domino's? You, subhanAllah, go to the local madrasa in your town. Take your sons with you. Your girls' madrasa, tell your wife and your girls to go visit. Take a tour and say, find out what's a meal time. Sponsor for one meal, but then also sit down and eat with them. That's going to have such a powerful impact. Go to an orphanage. Spend a day at the orphanage with the kids. And subhanAllah, let your children interact with them. Let them sit down and hear the stories. I promise you will have an impact. Last year I got a chance to go to India for a little bit. I was, it had such a powerful impact because I went to go, I went to an orphanage and it's just really has a powerful impact and I was like I was just wishing my, if my kids were with me to see that and I said this is what our children need they don't need Disneyland and Disney World they don't this is what they need they need a trip to a small orphanage they need a trip to a small madrasa they need a trip to small shacks and huts and in that place they will learn inshallah what you and I can't teach in our million dollar homes over here and in what we can teach in our massive universities here, which is adab and etiquette. So I've given you an actual plan about how to speak about this issue, but then do ta'alim of it. Share stories. Do it in a very discreet manner. May Allah give you and I tawfiq to do this in this manner. If we are very tough and harsh, then it will backfire. Instead, we have to do it in a very discreet manner. Okay? And may I, oh, everything I tell you, I don't pull it out of my back pocket. Every single thing I'm sharing with you, Alhamdulillah, I'm hearing from my teachers. Including visiting abroad is something my teachers are telling me to do. That's why I'm telling you this. And also, the fact that don't be harsh. And they said, one of my ustads said, if you be harsh with today's kids, I mean, really, he knows it. He's saying that. He said, wait, wait till they just get 15, 16. They'll just walk out on you. My, ne- my father never had to worry about that of his son walking out on him and my grandfather never had to worry about that but today this is a real reality that your son and daughter seriously may just walk out on you and they don't have to wait till 18 all of these bodies out there non for profits are just waiting to grab little shaitans out there saying come come you want to come here come come ajo, ajo, come 12 year old 13 or 14 year old you've been hearing what's happening outside so that's why we have to do it in a very discreet, loving manner. Cannot allow them to think that we're sitting there trying to correct them because no one wants to be corrected anymore. This is the reality. After, after you're doing all of this practical things, then comes down to the part of ruqya, dhikr, manzil, morning and evening, athkar, morning and evening, ayatul kursi, muawazatain, morning and evening. So, so important. Fard, fard in this day and age to make sure that shaitani germs infections that our kids are suffering from can get treated you can't treat that through water normal water you can't treat that through a soap bath you have to treat that through Quran recitation of Quran and dhikr let them listen to it let them recite it get yourself ready involved in it get every member of your household manzil let's all memorize it 30 verses of the Quran 
make a commitment for this summer that every single son and daughter, inshallah, will memorize it. I, I thank Allah and I thank my parents immensely for every morning having us recite Yasin and Manzil since I'm six or five years old. So, same thing we need to do at home. Every single day, read Manzil. Every single day, read Yasin. Every single day, have a dhikr regiment. And so that our children become habitual of this and make sure they do this twice a day. There are other ruqyas as well, the seven sevens that I always speak about. Uh, seven ayatul kursi, seven surah fatiha, seven ayatul kursi, sorry, seven salawat, seven ayatul fatiha, ayatul kursi, Quraysh, four qul and salawat. Blowing these on water and drinking, blowing it over our hands and wiping our body, and doing this regimen three to five times a day. Get them started at an early age. Just say, this is my daily dhikr we're going to do at home. Don't say this is ruqya. Don't say I'm trying to treat you. Don't say any of those things. Just say this is how we're going to do dhikr at home. Bas. And if they're, when they're young, they just hopefully listen and they say, okay, we'll do this. The niya should be Allah through the barakah of this. Whatever type of shaitani effects my son or daughter is suffering from, barakah of it, may Allah cure them. That is what we should keep in mind. So today we've covered one, only one statement of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And that was when he was describing inna ladina qalu rabbun Allah. Indeed, those people who say Allah is our Lord, thumma istaqamu, then they remain steadfast. Tatanazzalu alayhim al malaika. Then, if they remain steadfast, and then if they do not become crafty as foxes in front of Allah and in front of the parents and in front of the teachers, then and then only, tatanazzalu alayhim al malaika. At the time of their death, angels will descend and will tell them, Allah taqafu. You got nothing to worry about. You led an amazing life. Nothing to fear for the future. Wala tahzanu. Nothing to grieve over the past. Wa abshiru. And take the glad tidings. Bil jannah. Of paradise. Allati kuntum tu'adun. Which you had been promised all along. Nahnu awliya'ukum. We were your patrons and friends. Fil hayatid dunya. In the worldly life. Wa fil akhirah. And we shall be with you in the hereafter. Walakum fiha ma tashtahi anfusukum. And you will get in paradise whatever you desire. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ And you'll get in paradise whatever you ask for. نُزُولًا مِنْ غَفُورِ rahim, A beautiful way of welcoming the guest. مِنْ غَفُورِ rahim From the most forgiving, most merciful Lord. May Allah Azza wa allow us to hear these angels speak to us when it's our time of our death. And may our children, grandchildren and progeny, our spouses and our parents, and our grandparents who are alive, may Allah, may Allah allow them all to hear these statements of the angels at the time of death. May He allow all of us, inshallah, to lead, lead a life of istiqamah and steadfastness, of humility and humbleness in front of Allah, His Prophet, in front of our parents, in front of our teachers, in front of our elders, in front of our mashayikh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us freedom from the slavery of our nafs and grant us true slavery and servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. We will do some dhikr for a few minutes, followed by dua and a, a homemade breakfast uh, by Brother Mubeen. And his team, Jazakallah Khaira, who's been here early morning making halwa puri and all sorts of other things for all of us. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to become pleased with him and his team and for all the khidmah, mashallah, that um, our, our brothers, alhamdulillah, do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, continue to bless their families through the khidmah that these brothers do for the masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of their children. Say ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant best of tarbiyah to their kids. May Allah Azza wa Jal uh, remove any and all difficulties that they face in their lives. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا إله إلا الله 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 
لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد 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 صلى الله عليه وسلم استغفر الله 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 الذي لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم واتوب اليه لا اله الا انت سبحانك اني كنت من الظالمين لا اله الا انت سبحانك اني كنت من الظالمين لا اله الا انت سبحانك اني كنت من الظالمين لا اله الا انت سبحانك اني كنت من الظالمين 
لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم 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 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم انت سلام ونك السلام وتبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله اللهم لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم يا حي يا قيوم يا أحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كوف ولا أحد ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين اللهم ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت لهاب ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين رب اغفر وارحم وتجاوز عما تعلم إنك أنت العز الأكرم ربنا هب لنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا ربنا هب لنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا ربنا هب لنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا رب ارحمهما كما رب بياني صغيرة رب ارحمهما كما رب بياني صغيرة رب ارحمهما كما رب بياني صغيرة ربنا هب لنا من أزواج وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا المتقين إماما ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا المتقين إماما ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا المتقين إماما اللهم لك الحمد حمدا دائما مع دوامك ولك الحمد حمدا خالدا مع خلودك ولك الحمد حمدا حتى ترضى ولك الحمد حمدا إذا رضيت اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة تنجينا بها من جميع الأحوال والآفات وتقضي لنا بها جميع الحاجات وتطهرنا بها من جميع السيئات وترفعنا بها عندك على الدرجات وتبلغنا بها أقصى الغايات من جميع الخيرات في الحياة بعد الممات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم أصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا وأصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معشنا وأصلح لنا آخرتنا التي فيها معدنا وجعل للحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير وجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا اللهم نور قلوبنا بعلمك واستعمل أبداننا لطاعتك ووفقنا لما تحب وترضى من القول والعمل والنية والهدى إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا انتباعه اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا انتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطل ورزقنا اجتنابه وأرنا الباطل باطل ورزقنا اجتنابه اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان اللهم كره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان اللهم كره إلى الكفر والفسوق والعصيان اللهم اجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم اجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم اجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم إن نعوذك من شر اللهم إن نعوذك من شر أنفسنا اللهم إن نعوذك من شر أنفسنا اللهم إن نعوذ بك من إبليس وجنودي اللهم إن نعوذ بك من إبليس وجنودي اللهم إن نعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك ربي يحضرون اللهم إن نعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك ربي يحضرون اللهم إن نعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك ربي يحضرون اللهم إن نسألك علم نافع ورزق واسع وشفاء من كل داء اللهم إن نسألك 
لسانا ذاكرا وقلبا خاشعا وعينا دامعا ونفسا مطمئنة بقول قائك اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهاب همومنا وغمومنا وسائقنا إلى جناتك جنات النعيم اللهم خذ بنواصينا الخير اللهم خذ بنواصينا الخير اللهم أقبل بقلوبنا إلى وجه إلى دينك اللهم أقبل بقلوبنا إلى دينك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب اللهم يا مصرف القلوب اللهم يا مقلب القلوب اللهم يا مصرف القلوب صرف قلوبنا إلى طاعتك ثبت قلوبنا على دينك صرف قلوبنا إلى طاعتك ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا حي يا قيوم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل ونعوذ بك من سخطك والنار وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل اللهم إنا نعوذك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع اللهم إنا نعوذك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن نفس لا تشبع ومن نفس لا تشبع oh Allah we ask you to accept our gathering oh Allah whatever was shared when said if it was beneficial and it was correct indeed it was from you we ask you Allah to allow the speaker and the listeners to put into practice we allow our families to put into practice oh Allah if mistakes were made oh Allah we seek forgiveness for you for those mistakes oh Allah please do not hold us accountable for our mistakes ya Allah and overlook our mistakes and sins ya Allah oh Allah we ask you Allah to grant all of us and our loved ones and this entire community and our well wishers our, our volunteers our staff members our students past present oh Allah and their families oh Allah our patrons and donors and their families and all those who simply make dua for this place or ya Allah are a well wisher of this place oh Allah in any way shape or form are part of this vision and mission of this place whether they have gone away and passed away or they're still alive whether they were there in the earliest of stages or whether they are now here oh Allah whoever they may be we ask you ya Allah to grant all of them and all of us ya Allah complete forgiveness complete mercy oh Allah allow us ya Allah to be enveloped in your mercy oh Allah we ask you to grant us all the ability ya Allah to recognize right as right and practice on it and recognize wrong as wrong and to stay away from it oh Allah we ask you ya Allah to protect us from the onslaughts continuous onslaughts of Iblis and his armies oh Allah protect our homes from the continuous onslaught of Iblis and his armies oh Allah protect our children's hearts and minds from the onslaught of Iblis ya Allah oh Allah and from all the Dajjali fitan that is ran Rampant now, O Allah, before the arrival of Dajjal, O Allah, as the stage is being set for his arrival, O Allah, and Iblis is working extra hard, Ya Allah, with his armies, Ya Allah, to mislead us and our generations. O Allah, none can save us from this great, powerful makhluk of yours besides you. O Allah, Iblis is, cannot be defeated in a war, cannot be defeated in a battle through arms, and O Allah, through various things. O Allah, he is a creation of yours, and you've given him a life in this world that he shall never die. O Allah, you've given him powers that you have not given to anyone else. And Ya Allah, you've made Iblis and his army as a fitna and a test for us. O Allah, none, none, none can save us from this army besides you. O Allah, none can save us from his misleading armies besides Beside you, none can save us from the whispers of Shaytan. Beside you, O Allah, we ask you to protect us and our children and our progeny from the evil whisperings of Shaytan, from the evil whisperings of our nafs. O Allah, we ask you to grant us freedom from our nafs, freedom from the slavery of Shaytan. O Allah, grant us strength to be able to, Ya Allah, say no to all the haram temptations and sin. O Allah, grant us istiqamah and steadfastness on what's right. O Allah, we beg you, we are absolutely weak and useless servants. O Allah, of yours, O Allah, we are sinful, but at the end of the day, we are we don't claim to be servants of anyone besides you. Yours. O oh Allah, we don't extend our hands in front of anyone besides yours, besides you, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we are here begging you for your mercy, O oh Allah. We ask you, Ya Allah, to grant all of us and our children protection from the ans- from the latest and the newest fitan, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, create adab within myself, our us, all those who are listening, and our children and our progeny. O oh Allah, create adab and ihtiram. Create adab in good character in our elders, in our siblings, in ourselves. O Allah, make us all the best of, of mannered people. Grant us all the best of manners. O Allah, make us all most well mannered, Ya Allah. Most respecting, most loving, most caring, Ya Allah. O Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to completely allow us freedom from our nafs. Allow us to conquer our nafs. Allow us to not be a worshiper of our nafs, Ya Allah. O Allah, we ask you, Allah, to accept the efforts of all those who have allowed today and tomorrow to come true in this institution. The graduation of our high school students, the graduation of our HIF students, both male and female, the graduation of our 11th batch of Tanweer and one-year program students. O Allah, and tomorrow the graduation of the ulama from the seven-year takmil program and from the students of the qira'a program. O Allah, this could not have happened without, Ya Allah, you sending, Ya Allah, teachers, without you sending donors and patrons and well-wishers, without you sending volunteers, Ya Allah, without you sending well-wishers and people who pray for the hifadah and the protection of this place. O oh Allah, this is an entire massive group of people who are working, Ya Allah, because you have chosen them. O oh Allah, I beg you on this blessed weekend that you reward each and every single one of those people, Ya Allah, for all the khair and good that is happening here and all the khair and good that will ever happen in the future from the graduates of this institution. O oh Allah, grant all of them full ajar for everything that they have done to allow this institution to be where it is today. O oh Allah, 
Oh Allah, we are never content and happy with whatever level of ibadah we do and whatever level of work we do. Oh Allah, we're all sinful, we're all weak, we have much, much more to go. We can never, never fulfill the rights of ibadah to you. Oh Allah, we ask you to allow the future and the latter parts of our lives to be better than the previous parts of our life. Oh Allah, allow us to continue to grow spiritually. Allow, allow us to, Ya Allah, however we have spent our childhood or our adulthood, allow the end years of our life to be the very best. Oh Allah, allow us to do work that we've never done before. Allow us to serve the deen in ways that we've never done before. And allow us to go above and beyond our ambitions and our goals and allow us to truly truly ya Allah ya Allah bring a, a smile on the on the face of the Prophet sallam and allow us to truly lead our life in a manner that you will be so happy to see us on the day of judgment or that you will be happy in looking forward to meeting us and we will of course most definitely be looking forward to enjoying what you have prepared for us oh Allah allow us to lead such a life oh Allah grant all of us in every facet of our work and those who are part of this institution, the highest degrees of ikhlas, highest degrees of sincerity, highest degrees of ikhlas, allow us all to always regard ourselves as insincere, while you create within us the highest levels of sincerity. O Allah, create within us ittiba' sunnah, the ability to follow the sunnah in every single aspect of our life. Save us from any and all modern forms of interpretation of Islam, from any and all progressive movements, Ya Allah, from any and all reinterpretations of the Quran and a 1500 year tradition of sunnah. O Allah, protect us from all these fitan. Guide all those Muslims who have been misguided and protect us from falling into those fitan. O Allah, protect this masjid and this madrasa and all of you, all the masajid and all the dini madaris and all the dini institutions and the efforts of da'wah and tabliq and all the khanqas wherever they are from evil, from the evil attacks of shaitan and nafs, internal and external, Ya Allah. O Allah, whatever permissible desires and needs I have and all those who are listening here have, you are well aware of what is making us stay awake at night. You're well aware of why we lose sleep at night. You're well aware why our hair turns white so early, O oh Allah, because of the stress that every one of us is going through, the problems that we're faced with at home, at work, wherever it may be, O oh Allah, we ask you, Allah, the remover of problems, to remove our problems, Ya Allah, and remove, and remove every source of stress and difficulty, and bring with us, within us, Ya Allah, ease and comfort in this world and in the hereafter. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat ya ma yasifun, wa salamun ala mursaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ameen, ameen, ameen. Once again, like I mentioned in the dua, our graduations will start at 11 o'clock, inshallah, today for the Hafiz graduation. Lunch will be served at 12.30. After Dhuhr, the graduation of the high school and one-year program will begin. Tomorrow, inshallah, lunch again at 12.30. And then we'll have, inshallah, after Salat al-Dhuhr, the graduation of the Qira students, as well as, inshallah, the Takmil uh, program. Monana Uzair Bazi has just landed from Portland. Inshallah, he'll be giving uh, the final dars of Sahih al-Bukhari tomorrow in English. So please participate, inshallah, and attend this Mubarak Mahfil. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallah, bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do not forget to pray your ishraq two and two before you have breakfast or you head home.